Okay, um, we can, uh, I'll open it very quickly, very soon to everybody. You're gonna ask anything about globalization or Hong Kong, but let me uh, just say one, uh, one last thing. And that is, I find it very interesting sitting here in Africa in the presence of many of my European friends. That Europeans, when they went to Asia, when they went to Africa, they plunder those places. And coming from Hong Kong, I should know. And they colonized those places and took natural resources. While the Chinese today, they are paying for natural resources. They are buying them instead of plundering them. I remember, I remember 20 some years ago, I, I bumped into New Gingrich uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Davos. And he was the first one that told me, he said, Ronnie, pay attention to Africa. There's a lot of potential there. So I began to come to Africa. And I cannot help 23 years later ask the question, what has America done in Africa? Is that what Eric called hegemonic globalization? Or what is China beginning to do today, what he called something like connected globalization, such that in at least to, to begin with on an economic basis, where all the countries that can begin to share the economic benefit of globalization. So Eric, if you have anything to add, add it now. If not, I'll open to the, to, to the floor. We have plenty of time. Okay? Five, five seconds, but okay. I, what I mean by hegemonic global, globalization, hegemonic universalism is to have one hegemonic leader that applies the same set of standards and rules on everybody, uh, as opposed to what I call networked pluralism, is to allow different countries to engage globalization on their own terms. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I was in London to, uh, uh, the last few days. Five people told me how that the Hong Kong police was so restrained in the streets compared to Paris, Barcelona, New York, L Los Angeles, Chicago, London. So I encourage all of you, I don't want to debate this issue, just watch the full footage rather than the one na sna snapshot picked by the media. Watch the whole thing and then we'll have a discussion on that, okay? There's several people, the two gentlemen here in the front, the, the one back there first, and then the, gen the, the gentleman here, and then finally our friend from uh, Ethiopia. Thank you, Hervé Mariton. First, a quick question to uh, Eric Lee. Uh, well, a, a statement in a way. In the way you described political elections uh, in the West as a often tied and complex process, indeed, and you're right on that, uh, but maybe we prefer tied and uh, difficult elections to no elections at all. Uh, second question actually to the whole panel and the moderator indeed. Uh, don't you believe, uh, dear Chinese friends, that uh, actually the uh, attitude presently in Hong Kong would rather draw most of our countries, I'm French, in uh, more liking towards the US in the evolution of globalization. Globalization could be a multilateral process as was stated previously in the morning, Europe could stand in a way between China and the US in the idea that there should not be a US domination or Chinese domination. But since we believe that many of our values are presently challenged, maybe we feel more of a community of values with the US and the Western world. I just want to say again, as uh, indeed uh, Mr. Lung knows, and uh, his statement was very interesting concerning the basic law, that it is guaranteed by an international treaty and uh, the uh, scrutiny of the UN, and it is not, as indeed you've not stated, and that was very honest from you, sir, it is not a purely internal affair. Thank you. Eric? Well, I mean, if you like elections, by all means, have as many as you want, <laughs> and as often as you want. Maybe everyday referendum is better than elections. Uh, eventually, you'll produce some good leaders, I'm sure, uh, but don't, force other people to have them, or, or have them in your way. Uh, that's, that's my point, that's all. Okay. Uh, the Chinese don't force on, uh, their system on others, right? Okay, thank you. See why? On, on, on the question. Can you hear me? Is the mic yeah, on? it's on. Thank you. Um, on the question of the international treaty, uh, I presume you're referring to the treaty known as the Joint Declaration, signed in 1985, rectified, or rectified in 1985 between uh, China and the United Kingdom. 
insofar as the election is concerned, the election chief secretaries are concerned in the joint declaration, just in case uh, a few of our friends in the audience might buy the allegation that China goes back on its commitment to democratization in Hong Kong uh, set out in the joint declaration. Let me read, the, read, read this to you. The chief executive of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region shall be selected by election or through consultations held locally and be appointed by the central people's government, period. In other words, if China wanted to do away with the election committee election, which produced me as a last term chief executive and replaced it by consultations through consultations held locally and then upon the person at the end of the consultation process, China would not have breached the joint declaration. My com a comment to you, sir, is when you talk about the community of values, that's wonderful. I think the West has really brought some very good value <clears throat> to the world. That is, frankly, common to human nature. And you do it one way, you enshrine them, in co co you codify them, which is very good. But I asked Angela Merkel one time about six, seven years ago in Berlin. I said, Madame Chancellor, you keep talking about shared value. I said, I come from Hong Kong, uh, which is now part of China as an ethnic Chinese. Am I supposed to share your value? By saying so, so many times, you draw a line on the, on the sand and say, I am on this side, are you on my side or are you on the other side? <clears throat> I don't know what is the experience of the African friends. They have tried democracy since World War II. I wonder how many of them have been very, very successful. Perhaps there are other ways. Why should we fashion ourselves only after one way of achieving the common value, right? So shall we not allow others to do it their way as well? Mind you that Europeans and Americans only account for about a billion of the world's people. <clears throat> There's another six and a half billion out there that are they supposed to share your value and do it your way? It's just a question to be left for the audience to answer yourself. Sir? Let me, let me, uh, Thank you. Let, me, let me quickly, excuse me, let me very quickly chip in tongue in cheek. When I was a young child, I had this idealistic view of ultimate democracy for mankind on this planet. And this is, let all people in this world elect one leader and one government, a global leader and a global, global government. We now have 7 billion people on this planet, 1.4 billion Chinese, 1 billion Indians, and so on and so forth share values, democracy, ultimate democracy, one government, one leader, who that leader would be. What value would that be? Question mark. Now, that was when Xi Wai Leung was a young child with a rather simplistic view of life, the world. Now I know the world is much more complex than that. I don't hold that view anymore and I know the realities and the practicalities. Thank you. Sir, the, second general, the gentleman in the second row. Thank you, I'm coming from Israel. As I said, Mr. Lang said in the beginning when you spoke about Hong Kong that something which contradict election. You said there will be an election and after somebody had been elected, then the government of China had to appoint, appoint him. That's contradict election, which we know in the West, of course. I admire the po possibility and the power of China to <coughs> control 1.5 billion people. It's unbelievable. I see what happens in most very small countries, as I said, with a lot of problems and not with 1.5 billion. But still, I'm afraid that what happens in Hong Kong today is not good for China because of two reasons. One is the fact that they prove that it is possible to make achievement by protests. It could move, it could be export to China itself, to the mainland. Secondly, I'm not sure that this kind of action against the idea of sending the prisoners from Hong Kong to China to be judged is really important for China compared to these uh, riots that you have in, in Hong Kong. 
aren't you afraid about what we call the Maslow ladder, which now in China are coming up? You know, Maslow ladder say that the first stage of people is they want to have a security. And then second stage, they want to have food. And only when they have security and food, they want to teach, to study. And after they study, they want to put their opinion. They want to be involved in politics. I said that according when I follow China, I see that people are now standing in the fourth stage, which means the people of China would like, in my opinion, in the future to see themselves much more with an appoint to, to bring their opinion to the government, which means you will, in my opinion, China will face in the next future a lot of activity of Chinese people which would like, they would like very much to be involved in the political process and elect their own people. And maybe you will face in China what we are facing today in Hong Kong. So can you please relate to that? Thank you. Sure. Um, the experiences that we have in Hong Kong, internet-based, so-called be what approach, to rally as many people as possible, to disrupt normal lives of ordinary people and ordinary businesses, big and small, in Hong Kong. It's not patented. The first trial is in Hong Kong. Whether it's going to be successful or not, and I do not w wish this on any country in the world, I do not wish this. But my guess is it will replicate itself in other countries. So Hong Kong is not an island. Other countries are not islands either. No man is an island. If we succumb to these violent and disruptive movements, for unlawful demands on our basic law, other countries and other governments would suffer. That's point one. Point two, the central government of China, Beijing, has no role at all in the proposed amendment of the fugitive ordinance. It was initiative, initiated by the Hong Kong government. Nearly all laws, except certain national laws such as nationality, national emblem, national anthem, and so on. All laws enacted by the Hong Kong government, and that's part of the high degree of autonomy to enjoy. So it wasn't initiated by, by Beijing. Beijing has no role in that. Point number two. Point number three, this is not the first time Hong Kong enacts a piece of legislation or amend it or enter into a treaty with another jurisdiction to send fugitives back. In the proposed, now it's been uh, withdrawn formally, in the proposed amendment, we have put in more safeguards into the proposed amendment. There are already 22 jurisdictions in different parts of the world. I shouldn't name them. If I wanted to be discourteous to some of these countries, I should, so that you know that the record of rule of law in some of these 22 jurisdictions is actually not as good as the mainland of China. And I do ask the question, if people living in Hong Kong are so scared of facing trial on the mainland of China, in Shanghai, in Beijing, in Shenzhen, why would these cities on the mainland host millions of foreign business people living there? So these are the... Including Hong Kong. Including, including Hong Kong. So the, these are the... These are the points that I would, I would make. But let me just repeat what I said earlier. I'm beginning to see signs of people. Now, whether right or wrong, as Chinese people, we don't try to sort of poke our fingers in other people's pies. We are seeing the so-called extinction rebellion movement in parts of Europe copying the Hong Kong protesters, so-called be water approach. So be careful. I can't let that one go without a quick two quick comments. Okay, one, um, you know, the, the, the situation in Hong Kong happens to be the greatest birthday gift God has given to President Xi Jinping for the 70th anniversary of the People's Republic. Let me explain why. It's completely unified. It's the opposite of what you are predicting. It's completely unified public opinion in, Ch in mainland China. It's, it's unbelievable. It's showing the Chinese people liberalism's failures and why they shouldn't have it. Uh, so it's the opposite. And second, to your second point, uh, you know, elections, all that are great, and democracy is great when we're all for it, you know. But the, the fact is, 
liberal democracy is no longer producing governments that respond to the will of the people. Everywhere in the world, almost. I mean, you see that in public opinion poll after poll after poll in nine out of 10 liberal democratic countries. The elections don't deliver governments that respond to the interests and the will of the people. So we gotta, so maybe it doesn't work at this time. I have a problem, and all of you have a problem. There's four hands. He's Two gentlemen waiting. from he's, Africa, he's been waiting. Well, one gentleman here, and then a lady over there. Over run by five minutes. Huh? Yeah, I know, we're over, already overrunning. Yeah. So, Terry, uh, tell me what to do, okay? Sir, please. Yeah. <clears throat> I would like to raise uh, two or three questions. Uh, <laughs> while Hong Kong is important, but uh, I would like this panel to focus on the other important issues also. I represent Africa. I want to know, to listen to some questions uh, that will affect us, our continent. So if I may ask, uh, on the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, I believe it's uh, an important project and program and the way I see it is, there has been three infrastructure miracles in this uh, uh, 20th century. The Swiss Canal, which connected Asia and Europe. The Panama Canal, which connected, changed the trade pattern. And the Euro Tunnel, which connected UK and Europe. There might have been some geological, geopolitical impact of this infrastructure, maybe the British, had bigger role, benefit on Swiss Canal, the US on the Panama Canal, but ultimately it was an important force to connect. So my question here on the infrastructure is, as it appears now, the BRI primarily focuses across Asia, Europe, and even the maritime or silk connects some part of Africa how can the BRI be designed in a way that it doesn't exclude Africa and Africa benefits from mm. this uh, uh, connection. The second point, we want to see more productive investment to Africa. Ethiopia has benefited from Chinese manufacturing investment and uh, of all investment in Ethiopia, 67% of companies are investing in manufacturing. We want to see more because we need employment. Africa needs to create 20 million jobs every single year. And that's why the G20 countries developed compact with Africa. We are not seeing sufficient relocation of Chinese investment. They are mainly focused in Asia, which I would say a backyard of China. So how can the private sector the Chinese government gives special attention to, to this uh, idea. The last point, there may be differences in political view, but we need to work on the common ground of the United Nations principle. For African countries, we don't want any big powers to intervene in internal affairs. Non-interference is one of the basic principles of the United Nations. And I believe we have always to be reminded of uh, this uh, principle. Thank you, sir. Uh, with that, can I ask the gentleman at the back also to ask his question and then we'll answer it together. We're, I'm really in trouble. Eight minutes over time, there's still two hands over there and more. Yes, uh, sir. Merci, Monsieur le Modérateur. Je m'appelle Robert Dossou. Je suis président de l'Association africaine de droit international et ancien ministre des Affaires étrangères de la République du Bénin. Vous avez interpellé l'Afrique. Le représentant du Premier ministre d'Éthiopie a répondu sous un aspect. Moi, je donnerai ma réponse sous forme de question. Vous avez soulevé la question des droits de l'homme et je pose la question suivante. Est-ce qu'un être humain, du seul fait qu'il est être humain, qu'il soit noir, vert, jaune, blanc, rouge ou colo, chocolat, comme vous voulez, n'a-t-il pas des droits communs avec toute l'humanité entière Voilà la question. Quelles que soient les modalités de mise en œuvre. Deuxième question sur la démocratie. Est-ce que le concept de démocratie ne dégage pas ou n'est pas fondé sur des paramètres communs à toute l'humanité 
quelles que soient les modalités de mise en œuvre. Parce qu'en Afrique, si nous examinons les instruments qui ont été adoptés en matière de droits de l'homme, en matière de démocratie, par l'Union africaine et par les communautés économiques régionales, on trouve quelque chose de très fort. Mais quand on les confronte à la mise en œuvre sur le terrain, on rencontre des spécificités où l'on va jusqu'à dire que la démocratie n'est pas faite pour l'Africain. On a entendu ça. Merci. Thank you. Uh, this gentleman, I, I, I have to, and then the lady at the very back, and then we have to call it quit. It's, we're already in 10 minutes over time. I want to get out of this country tomorrow. I don't want to be detained here. I need to go to work. Yes, sir. Merci. Toujours l'Afrique. Leïl Choubi, ancien ministre euh, Algérie. Je, vous, je voudrais très rapidement, pour aboutir à une question qui me semble essentielle, sur le débat de la globalisation et de, des approches de développement. Mais auparavant, je voudrais faire un lien entre la session de tout à l'heure et celle de maintenant. Euh, L'acteur essentiel de la démocratie, c'est la société. L'acteur majeur de l'économie, c'est la société. Ce que nous remarquons, dans les crises actuelles, Irak, Libye, Mali, Soudan, c'est des fractures territoriales majeures. Pays kurdes, Benghazi, nord du Mali. Cela veut dire que la question de la fracture territoriale et la question des fractures sociales est un élément constitutif majeur et du développement et de la démocratie. Rapporté aux approches de globalisation, est-ce que derrière la grande question du financement et de l'endettement des infrastructures. Le développement infrastructurel est essentiel pour un développement durable et un développement, une modernisation de sociétés et de territoires. Or, les approches jusque-là, vous l'avez dit, ont été différentes. Pour les uns, on estime que ça n'est pas rentable, donc on ne finance pas. Et donc, il y a la question de l'endettement, encore que les États-Unis, sur la dernière année, ont changé totalement leur approche et leur législation sur le financement des infrastructures en Afrique. Et donc, lorsqu'on dit aux Africains, attention, tel pays est en train de vous endetter, on oublie de dire que les pays en question qui soulèvent cette question ont fait de l'endettement dans l'approche de leur développement une question majeure. L'Europe est un des continents les plus endettés. Nous avons 325% d'endettement à l'échelon mondial et beaucoup de grands, y compris le vice-président de la banque, l'ancien vice-président de la banque britannique, dit que l'endettement menace l'Europe. Mais est-ce que derrière tout cela, il n'y a pas une question d'approche Quand on voit nos amis chinois ou nos amis euh, européens sur les grandes questions, la route de la soie ou la route du de, 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 de la, de, la démarche de globalisation, pour les uns, ils estiment devoir structurer la périphérie pour la moderniser, la faire aboutir à un certain niveau pour pouvoir continuer un espace. Et vous l'avez dit, c'est latent. Vous avez dit il y a un milliard en face de 6 milliards. Vous estimez que donc la structuration de la périphérie, la mettre à un niveau, est une question majeure. Donc, en partie, donc la question du financement de l'infrastructure se pose autrement que la question de, de l'endettement. Donc, ma question, est-ce qu'il n'y a pas des approches totalement divergentes dans ce fameux débat de la globalisation, ce débat de la démocratisation et ce débat développement ou croissance. Merci. Thank you. The last question from the lady at the back there, please. Unfortunately, oh, it's not a lady. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's it's my, my no, apology. No, it's no, no, it's old age. It's and Your I, hair is beautiful. And I have hair. Beautiful. Um, thank you, Chairman. I'm Stephen Erlanger from the New York Times. And I was in Hong Kong the night of the actual handover, and I tried to follow it. I've been very struck by the defensive tone of all of you, mixed with an aggressiveness, um, which I find striking and common now when I hear Hong Kong Chinese and mainland Chinese speak to Western audiences. Actually, I don't think anybody cares whether China has democratic elections or not. No one's forcing you to do it. What I would like to know is, do you think Xi Jinping announcing himself as emperor for life and creating Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping thought as an equivalent to Mao is a good thing for China or a bad thing? Okay. okay we will.
<clears throat> I'll leave it to Eric and uh, Mr. Leung. Well, emperor for life, certainly he didn't pronounce that, and that sounds like to me a lot more aggressive and defensive on the part of the New York Times than ever, anything <laughs> that we've ever said. Um, I don't think that deserves a good, res uh, you know, a, a sensible response. Of course, he's not emperor for life. Um, he, uh, we had a constitutional amendment that got rid of term limits for the, pre for the, for the uh, role of the presidency. Uh, General Secretary, the role of General Secretary never had term limits, uh, but we have retirement uh, customs, so they are supposed to be followed. Um, so it's, he's not emperor for life. Um, and let me come back to our friend from Ethiopia. Um, of course, Africa is an integral, important part of the BRI vision, um, that the Eurasian mass being united through infrastructure and Africa being linked into the Eurasian mass, I think creates tremendous opportunities. Now, China is a new kid on the block. <laughs> we haven't been at it for very long, so we're going to make plenty of mistakes, okay? Our companies don't know what to do in, in these uh, uh, new countries. Our companies don't know how to work with local communities, for instance, because uh, in China, you know, we have county sec party secretary who is like a CEO who helps the company in, in, in these different countries. The situation is completely different. So we need help. Um, and, and what we, you know, what Africa could do, and I hope it will do, is for African countries to produce great and strong leaders, uh, like Mr. Kagami, who will be speaking tonight, like Mr. Ahmed, perhaps, is uh, on the way of becoming. Um, and only with strong leaders uh, can you take advantage of what China have, has to offer. Um, so, so that's, that's that. Um, I don't, I've forgotten the question. Okay, so right. Let me, just, let me just very quickly respond to the Belgium Road uh, uh, questions. Um, if we in Hong Kong, or we in the rest of the country, China, could do anything to promote better mutual understanding not just of investment opportunities in the various countries in Africa, but also what Africa is about. Please let us know. We'll be quite happy to oblige. I founded the Belgian Road uh, Hong Kong Center, for example, two years ago, and, and this center sponsored young school children and the teachers and the headmasters and headmistresses to go and visit, excuse the term, off the beaten track countries along the Belgian Road and they all come back with new vision of life. And so these are the next generation of collaborators. Now, if you want to take a you know, shorter term approach, if there are certain sectors or industries that you're open to Hong Kong or mainland Chinese investments, uh, uh, sir, you have my name card, uh, let us know. China and Hong Kong included often gives people the, the impression that we have unlimited ambitions under the Belgian Road Initiative or unlimited appetite uh, under this initiative. The reality is, is are, of course, not. We do have capacity constraints. And one of the constraints that we face at the moment is not so much capital, um, but human resources. And that's why it is, it is important for us to send people to your countries to see what opportunities are. Thank you. Um, there's I'd another question about human rights that I want to address briefly. Um, of course, there are universal aspirations for, for all mankind as part of a human condition. Um, but those aspirations don't have ne to necessarily be liberal. Um, and, 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 and if you ascribe rights to men, these rights may be in conflict. If you read the UN Declaration of Universal Rights or whatever the document is called, every right in there is in conflict with every other right. <laughs> so what are our priorities? What we've got to do? So, so to me, equality is a universal aspiration. And equality, and, and, and to me, in every country, there shouldn't be, in, in today's modern world with this abundance of material wealth, we shouldn't have people living under absolute poverty line. Okay, we just should not, it's not conscionable, unconscionable. So to me, that's a universal aspiration. But liberalism is not delivering on these universal aspirations. Um, and, and China's socialist system, I think, is doing a little better job. I mean, we, have, we make a lot of mistakes, we have a lot of faults, uh, but, but we don't have these liberal elections, 
but we are becoming, we are, we are lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. In fact, we're two years away from eradicating poverty uh, uh, below the absolute poverty line. Um, about 20, 30 million people left. Um, that's a universal aspiration. Okay, with that, I'm going to call it to a quit because I have been told to just, uh, I, I, have, I must cut it. Uh, <laughs> I think I, being over, over time, I have to now commit uh, harakiri, go outside. Uh, but last sentence is, I think that it will be very important for all of us, whether you are from Europe, from Africa, from China, to bring America back to become part of the globalized world. I think the best world forward is where one, the US, Europe, China, and many other countries should work together rather than having any, um, especially a major country like the United States moving increasingly toward isolationism. And that to me is my biggest worry. So shall we just leave it at that and we'll be happy to talk off offline. Thank you.